you have the floor. Okay, thank you very much, Alex. I want to thank Councilmember QB uh, for uh, uh, partnering up with me uh, for this event today. Uh, we're really excited about it. Uh, we've been talking about it for a long time. We have so many things going on. We wanted to educate the public about uh, what was happening and, and get our key players in for this, uh, this call. So uh, good afternoon. I'd like to welcome everyone to our Human Services Connection event. Thank you for taking time out of your busy lives and schedules to be part of this conversation. We have some great partners around the virtual table today, and Council Member QB and I are grateful for the opportunity to share their work with the community. This is such a difficult time for all of us right now. It has never been more important that our nonprofit, faith community partners, and human services department come together to tackle these issues we are facing now and in the future as we work on our recovery. Human services is a very broad field, but today's event is focused on homelessness, hunger, and poverty, all of which are particularly relevant at this moment in time. I am eager to hear what our presenters are seeing and hearing in their daily interactions with people who are coming to them for help. Some of our community are reaching out for the very first time because of the impacts of the pandemic in need of rent assistance or a food box or healthcare or counseling or all of the above. I know that our nonprofits and human services staff have risen to the challenges these past several months and are also looking at a new innovative way to do the work that will be needed down the road. Recently, Tempe Community Agency opened its Oasis Drop-In Center for people experiencing homelessness. I had the uh, great opportunity to get to visit the site, recommend anybody interested to go down and check it out it's it's really a, a great site and a, um, a great concept important addition to our community is designed to offer a bridge between between homeless and house it's a great example of the work being done in our community that gives me hope during these extraordinary times with that we'll give a quick overview of how the event will run today and then begin our first session um, our first speaker today is uh, Naomi, and Naomi um, Farrell is, she is the um, head of our human uh, services department. And so she, they do a wide range of uh, services, including housing, um, care seven, counseling, diversion, all kinds of things. Uh, and they work very closely with our nonprofits out in the community. So Naomi, if you wanna, um, if you wanna uh, take, take it from here, you're, you're welcome to. Um, Council Member Adams, uh, prior sure. before we do that, I want to step in really quick just to okay. inform um, our audience that if you have any questions, feel free to utilize the uh, Q&A feature that is built into the WebEx interface. Um, and we will uh, have a session uh, um, midway uh, during our show today for um, you to ask questions to uh, the people who present. And then we'll also have a question at the um, Q&A session at the end. If you guys have some problems with you using the Q&A feature, please um, email um, Kristen Gwen. Uh, she is also the other council that's online. Uh, so um, attached is her email here, Kristen underscore, underscore Gwen at Tempe.gov. Um, she'll be checking her email, but we'll also be monitoring the Q&A. Um, with that, um, Naomi, you have the floor. Naomi, if you are speaking, your mic is uh, not on. Sorry, sorry, thanks Alex. Again, thank you everyone um, for joining us today. We've got a full program. I will give you a brief um, summary on the human services landscape right now and then turn it over to our amazing presenters. First, a bit about our human services department. We are just about five years old. We had programs and services being offered under various city departments and came together as human services to improve and streamline our work for the community. Today, we have nearly 200 full and part-time employees. We are focused around three pillars, crisis, stability, and self-sufficiency. 
Our work runs the gamut, affordable housing for our veterans and seniors, mental health resources for youth, preschool for our young learners, a memory cafe for families and caregivers who, whose loved ones have memory loss, emergency shelter units for victims of domestic violence. We want to ensure that we support individuals and families through the entire human experience to improve their quality of life. Our team collaborates heavily with other city departments, including the police and fire departments, the city attorney's office, community services, and others. We also work with many other partners in the community and region. And I can't express enough how we can't and do not do this work alone. It is through these partnerships with nonprofits, schools, the faith community, and other governments that create true collective impact. Next slide, please. In the past six months, our mission has taken on even greater importance. Like the other presenters you'll hear from today, we have had to pivot and think differently to continue serving the community. Our CARE 7 crisis response team began offering free counseling sessions to help residents navigate the impacts of the pandemic. Our youth specialists who normally work with students on school campuses reached out by phone and email to offer support and drop off food and supplies for families. We've continued to support victims of domestic violence and other veterans with in-person, virtual, virtual, and phone support. We connected new and existing clients with city and community resources. Housing services continued to plan for the purchase of affordable housing units to expand housing options, which is a critical need in Tempe that we did not want to stall. We've continued operating our emergency shelter units for victims of domestic violence and people experiencing homelessness. This provided a safe place to stay while staff worked on housing plans to stabilize the individuals and families in those units. We have provided $300,000 in emergency rent assistance and continued supporting residents with emergency home repair grants. Soon we expect to begin offering free flu shots to housing clients through a partnership with the Maricopa County Public Health. Next slide, please. Homeless solutions and housing services very quickly set up temporary congregate and non-congregate housing for vulnerable individuals. We continue operating the non-congregate shelter as a local hotel, at a local hotel. Knowing that our nonprofits were overwhelmed with challenges, we've offered, we have offered up to $500,000 in nonprofit grants supporting homeless services. We've also hired a full-time homeless outreach specialist for Hope, the HOPE team to bolster our street outreach efforts. To meet emergency needs, we set up a temporary shower program and purchased a mobile shower unit. One of our larger undertakings involved opening a cooling center for the first time. Our staff became concerned when all the usual city buildings and businesses that provided heat relief for those outdoors closed due to the pandemic. Multiple city departments came together to quickly identify a city facility, staffing needs, PPE supplies, and COVID protocols to open the cooling center. So far, we have served nearly 2,000 visitors there. Our Hope and Care 7 teams are on site to assist individuals and connect them to resources. Next slide, please. As our city begins recovery efforts, we are excited about new opportunities that will allow us to expand our reach and strengthen our work with community partners. This week, we have opened up the RFP process to make available $500,000 in COVID recovery grants for nonprofits. Please visit tempe.gov backslash human services for more details as they become available. Also, in October, we will be offering a new financial navigator program to help people impacted by the pandemic connect and connect them with financial resources. The program will be available through CARE 7, our crisis response program. We will be working with nonprofits to let them know that this program is available to their clients. There are also plans to expand emergency shelter units and purchase more affordable housing through the Tempe Housing Authority's nonprofit affiliate. The city just learned last week that we will be receiving nearly $2 million for rent and mortgage assistance. This is an entirely new program for us and, we're, and we will be working now to set it up and hire staff. We have plans to launch our age-friendly initiative to promote healthy aging. Especially during this time, we want to understand what resources are needed in our community, how needs have changed during the pandemic and how we can best respond. 
we will be reaching out to the community and partner agencies for input. And we are really excited to continue planning for a proposed Envision Center, which brings together human services, sustainability, and workforce development. The goal of the center is to take a holistic approach to foster long-lasting self-sufficiency, and we are hoping to realize this dream early next year. Next slide. Before I close, I would like to encourage everyone to take a look through our Human Services Impact Report for 2018 and 19. We, this will give you a high-level overview of nearly 90 human services programs either operated by the City of Tempe or supported through grants by our nonprofit partner, Tempe Community Council. Now, I know you are eager as well as I am to hear from others about their work. I'd like to now introduce you to Deborah Artiega, Executive Director of Tempe Community Action Agency. TCAA, TCAA serves seniors, adults, and families struggling to meet basic needs and helps them move toward independence. Like our other nonprofit presenters here today, TCA TCAA is a valuable community partner. Deborah? Thank you, Naomi. Can you all hear me okay? Perfect. Great, I'm unmuted. Um, as many of you know, TCAA was founded in 1966 in the very neighborhood I'm sitting in today by two Tempe women. And we've operated in this same community from the very beginning, evolving over the years to anticipate and respond to emergent community needs and help residents of all ages overcome crisis and live their best lives. People who are experiencing unstable housing, food insecurity, and poverty have continued to struggle with limited access to resources, especially now. Hunger, poverty, and homelessness have remained the focus of our agency since 1966. We do this through nine different programs that serve thousands of Tempe households each and every year. I'll unpack each of these programs and highlight the pandemic's impact in the next few slides. Slide, please. We begin with our food pantry program and our hunger relief efforts are the largest, have the greatest impact in our organization in terms of the volume of food provided to the community and the number of people served. Um, through the pandemic, we not only adjusted hours to make it easier to access food during the least hot hours, um, we unfortunately had to place a temporary hold on private donations of food, which has since been lifted. Um, we implemented new services such as delivering food boxes to vulnerable seniors enrolled in our senior programming. Uh, but we also had to make adjustments to our space. We have small facilities and uh, had to create uh, lines outside um, to be able to accommodate long lines of individuals uh, needing emergency food assistance. But as an extension of that effort, we also continue to deliver food boxes um, each and every month to Tempe and Kyrene K-12 schools and that way households with children have an additional way to access food, not only at the school site during their meal programming, but also at our site. Our community action program provides emergency rent, mortgage, and utility assistance, and has done this since the early 1970s when community action programs uh, started to um, evolve over the nation. Through our CAP agency, we are receiving additional CARES Act funds through Maricopa County to supplement rent and utility assistance that we already provide. We geared up with several different staff in order to accommodate increasing numbers of households requesting services and are offering um, over the phone, text-based and web-based um, options to be able to access those services. Our emergency shelter, I help, many of you are familiar with the iHelp program. We're reaching our 16th uh, birthday in Tempe, operating the city's only comprehensive emergency shelter program, done in partnership with many faith-based partners and many service groups throughout the city. Um, iHelp has continued to operate through the pandemic. We continue to be able to offer nightly shelter for men and women, um, as well as meals and an array of social services to be able to help individuals get on a pathway to permanent housing. We implemented a health screening requirement as a prerequisite for enrollment in the shelter through the pandemic period at, um, and currently continue that today, um, offering utility assistance for our host sites to help those congregations be able to cover important uh, utility bills as we were using their sites in the early phases of the pandemic. Through our partnership with the city of Tempe, we've helped them sanitize those sites each morning when our individuals are moving on through their daily activities. 
and we modified our meal delivery services at the shelter sites to make it safer for volunteer groups. Council Member Adams mentioned the Oasis Drop-In Center and, and although stay-at-home mandates work for people that have a home, uh, when you don't, it becomes impossible and, and certainly elevated health risk to be on the street. So uh, we opened the Oasis Drop-In Center in, in July after a very quick planning period and fundraising period and with help from our board of directors. This program operates on Apache Boulevard. It's a walk-in uh, relief center, not only for heat relief, but also a number of services to be able to get into a, a plan to overcome homelessness. It's also our iHelp intake site. And uh, not only can folks access computers and phones, they can do their laundry there, access mail, get emergency food bags, get help with identification documents, and uh, moving their way to shelter and other supports. Slide, please. Our senior, our senior nutrition programs include congregate meal service that we've traditionally done at Tempe Senior Centers and the Home Delivered Meal Program, which operates throughout the entire area. Um, home Delivered Meal enrollments increased significantly, especially when senior centers closed. Uh, we put a temporary hold on that congregate meal service and created a meal to go option for seniors that wanted to drive through, access a nutritious, hot, catered meal, and uh, take that meal home. In addition to that, we modified our home delivered meal uh, service delivery um, procedures to avoid person-to-person -person contact and meal handoffs. Uh, we also increased the volume of meals that each participant receives. Um, our Neighbors Helping Neighbors in-home care program um, placed a temporary hold on some of the in-home supports, but continue to offer home-based support through our social workers, very limited transportation assistance, in the early phases of the pandemic and placed a hold on new enrollments at this time, just working more intensively with the seniors that are, that are enrolled in that program. Our Health Start program is probably the least known in our community and we've operated that program for almost 20 years now throughout the whole East Valley. Uh, we offer uh, prenatal and postpartum care and services for low income minority households and um, provide in-home assistance until the baby turns age two to make sure those children are born in a healthy and raised in a healthy, safe environment. We put a temporary hold, as you can imagine, on some of that in-home uh, care, but also created many phone-based and virtual services to continue providing support to those households. Our Financial Success Center was the first that opened in Tempe. It opened uh, three years ago through a pilot program funded through the Polium Foundation. We started the Financial uh, Service Center with offering uh, a bundled approach to getting folks to be able to improve their income and their economic independence. At our Financial Success Center, we offer financial coaching bundled with employment assistance and income supports to help a family be able to overcome economic disadvantage. And that's done in partnership with Maricopa County that loans a career advisor to us. They're stationed at our site part-time and we're in the process of getting that program restarted after a temporary hold through the early phases of the pandemic. Our community engagement approach is the integration of volunteers, both from the business community and uh, city residents at large in offering an array of support. We work alongside our staff and have continued to do so uh, throughout the past several months. Like Dee? So the programs that have experienced the greatest demand uh, going back since early March, um, obviously emergency rent assistance and just some quick data points just over the past several months up through August, uh, we've received unduplicated requests from close to 2000 households. Since that's a data point from August, I'm sure it has surpassed 2000 at this point. We've had more than 2000 application downloads from our website from households um, seeking to apply for emergency rent assistance. Through our CARES Act funding, we can provide assistance to about 800 households through December with additional funding that we're uh, tapping into and, and seeking, we'll be able to help many more households. And these are households specifically that have experienced economic hardship because of COVID-19. Our emergency food services, not only in the food pantry, but also in senior nutrition, have definitely seen increase. Um, for example, seniors accessing home delivered meals increased from 280 to close to 500 at this point. Um, that's daily counts of individuals receiving meals. And our in-home care services, as I mentioned, have been limited at this point. Emergency shelter and daytime respite center 
just as an example of the demand for the Oasis Center, just in the first two months that that center has been open, we've had 779 sign-ins from people coming in and seeking services. Uh, I imagine that's going to continue to grow as the word gets out uh, on the street with that resources available to those in need. We're also seeing, obviously, longer stays in shelter due to restricted ability to access jobs and housing options at this point. Slide, please. Moving forward, we're um, looking at all of our programs and our prioritization of services for individuals and with the intention to prioritize services to households impacted by COVID-19. And that may be a financial impact or health impact um, any, any, any way that they've been affected by the pandemic will be seen as priorities for services. We'll continue to offer expanded nutritional services for seniors and adults with disabilities. I expect that the way that we're accommodating those home delivered meal needs will continue through 2021. We, as I mentioned, are restarting our employment assistance and financial coaching. We are giving priority to individuals seeking emergency rent assistance for that employment assistance and financial coaching through our, our financial uh, success center. We are uh, slowly but surely beginning to gear up again towards in-home care for seniors and older neighbors helping neighbors. And we look forward to an opportunity to be able to restart Congregate meals at senior centers at some point with our city partners that we expect that we'll continue to still offer the drive through meal to go service for those seniors who feel more comfortable accessing it in that way. And as we expand uh, our ability to bring partnerships into the Oasis drop in center, we expect to expand on the variety of services that that offers uh, for our organization and our leadership. We as we see individual increased demand for services, we continue to struggle with limited facility need, um, facility space. And uh, as an organization, we're looking to the future to try to figure out how we how we adjust and, and accommodate that that challenge in the future. Slide, please. Overall, for the individuals and families that we're serving, there's certainly increased stress. There's isolation, frustration. They have limited ability to be able to access their traditional supports, whether that's family in the community or out of state or friends or other networks, um, that is very restricted right now and is, is leading to a great deal of emotional distress. We're finding greater need and more long-term need for basic essentials and really folks coming in seeking multiple services, not just a single service as, as we have in the, as seen in the past. Housing insecurity compounded by extreme heat that we faced over the summer that made the uh, walk-in demand for the Oasis Center much more than that facility could safely accommodate. And we have lines every day of folks that are uh, waiting to be able to use that site. Um, we have remained open throughout all of this. We've had no employees laid off or furloughed or cut in hours. And as you can imagine, our, our team is tired, uh, but energized by our ability to serve the need in the community. Certainly with our organization and most nonprofits, there is a great deal of financial uncertainty um, where, um, you know, one of the adjustments we've made this year is we've canceled our major fundraising event that we normally have in October. It, it is a face-to-face -face event and we'll look to other strategies to raise funds to meet the continuing need in the future. On the positive side, we have continued to see folks coming forward and wanting to volunteer and that is really encouraging to us great deal of improved efficiencies to these new ways that we're serving the community. And I think greater public awareness and understanding of human service needs is one of the positive benefits that have come out of this situation. And at this point, I'm going to turn this um, presentation over to our partners at uh, Mountain Park Health Center. And uh, thank you for the time you've allowed for me today. I want to, at this point, introduce Matt Jewett, Jamie Pearl Starks, and Ted Fugietis with Mountain Park Health Center of Tempe. Mountain Park is a, now, is a nonprofit community health center that offers whole patient care for the entire family and focuses on giving the community access to affordable primary care. Take it away, Mountain Park. Janie, I think you're muted. There we go. That's a great way to start. Hi, everyone. Um, we will, there's three of us, and so we will get through this information. That's important information. We'll get through it pretty quickly. Next slide, please. 
So Mountain Park Health Center, we'll give you a little bit of who we are first and then talk about what we've been doing during COVID. We have seven clinics around the valley and our clinics range from all the way on the west side in Goodyear to Maryvale. And Maryvale, as many of you know, has been one of the hardest hit areas in the nation. We were featured nationally for being responding to COVID in Maryvale. We have almost a thousand employees and for us, our employees and our more than 90,000 patients, a lot of them are, are two in one. A lot of our employees are patients. A lot of our patients become employees. Um, and a lot of our patients have been patients with us for generations. So we treat the grandfather who then had children and now we're seeing the grandkid as well uh, through 395,000 patient visits a year. And so for us, it's we don't wanna just see people when they're sick. We want to see people all throughout the year and make sure that they stay well and prevention is a key thing for us. Uh, Deborah, you mentioned your plans changing a little bit this year. This year is our 40th anniversary <laughs> and our team had worked very hard to do a lot um, to prepare for our 40th anniversary and to celebrate it. Uh, but but honestly, when you think about it, there's, there's not a better way when you're a healthcare organization who is committed to working with uh, those who need us the most. Our patients, 98% of our patients fall under 200,000 percent, sorry, 200% of the federal poverty level. And so we really do view that as an honor to be able to be there. Uh, I just realized I did not introduce myself. My name is Janie Pearl Starks. I'm the Director of Equity, Diversity and Engagement at Mountain Park. And I'll tell you a little bit more about what we do under our Mountain Park roof. Next slide, please. Thank you. So under we, we like to view it as whole person care under one roof. And so people can come to the doctor's office, uh, the pediatrics visit, well woman visit, family medicine, internal medicine. And then from there, maybe they need a nutrition, a visit with a nutritionist. Maybe right now we know there's a lot going on. And so they might meet with one of our behavioral health consultants. Uh, and then we have dental departments, uh, dental where we also do preventative dental and a pharmacy in all of our clinics is in most of our clinics as well. And so we really try to find out how we can help the person. Whole person care is our main thing. And we provide it in Tempe. I know my mom is a patient at our Tempe clinic. If you look at Ted's background, you can see our clinic. It's right on the corner of McClintock and Broadway. It's a beautiful facility. It used to be uh, Skipper Bud's Boatyard. And so a lot of people, when we saw the transformation, it was really uh, fascinating to see how we turned it into a boatyard and to a clinic that people can enjoy both inside and outside. And now Matt will talk a little bit about what we've been doing during COVID. All right, I think I've successfully unmuted. Thanks, Janie. My name is Matt Jewett. I am the Director of Grants here at Mountain Park. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about the medical services and how those have been impacted during COVID. Um, obviously, that slowed down right away. Uh, many people were not eager to come into a medical facility with COVID. Uh, we moved very quickly to telehealth visits, either through video chat or through the phone, something that um, we had not really done before. And now about half of our visits are those kinds of virtual visits. Total, our visits are about 90% of what they were during uh, pre-pandemic now. Um, our testing that we are doing on our patients for COVID is now coming back faster. You may have heard that it was taking up to two weeks and we were experiencing that. We're now getting those tests back in about two to three days. And our positivity rate that I think was uh, around 20% has now fallen to about 5%. Um, the number of tests that we are doing has been pretty steady at about 200 a week. That's between all of our locations. Our child vaccinations are down because while we still see many people coming in for those um, telehealth visits, uh, it's harder to get people to come to the in-person visits. And so uh, our child vaccinations are down 22% in the first three months of the pandemic compared to the previous year. Um, also, we have done pretty well in terms of having adequate PPE supply. We have about four weeks of supply on hand right now. Um, we've also given away, uh, we, we are very uh, into supporting our kids and our families during back to school. And we want to do that regardless of what back to school looks like so that we can keep kids healthy with those back to school physicals, with the vaccinations. And we've also given away 5,000 back to school backpacks uh, with those physicals. And those are stuffed with supplies that our students need to help them succeed, especially in this year where uh, learning looks a little bit different. Um, next, uh, next slide, please. 
So we have also addressed the issue of food insecurity. We do provide food insecurity for, uh, we do provide screening for food insecurity for our patients. Of our seven clinics, Tempe has been running the highest in terms of the patients that screen positive for food insecurity. Um, it is around 35%, but it was uh, well into the 40s during the summer. Uh, Mountain Park uh, also wants to report on a generous contribution of $4,000 that we received from uh, Tempe Community Foundation for food distribution at our Tempe clinic. Uh, we have uh, provided food with that money to 202 families, 925 individuals. Um, we also have a partnership at our other clinics through St. Mary's Food Bank Alliance, which does not serve uh, Tempe or the East Valley. Um, and that has also led to uh, more than 20,000 people being fed with, I think, over 200,000 pounds of food uh, at our other clinics. And a food bag typically includes a bag of produce. That could be uh, potatoes, tomatoes, cantaloupe, watermelon, celery, cabbage, whatever's in season and available. Uh, two pounds of pinto beans and two pounds of rice, uh, four cans of tuna, a loaf of bread, a dozen eggs, and we throw in a children's book and a pack of crayons thanks to a donation from First Things First. Also information on our eligibility that we provide for um, access, kids care, um, SNAP, uh, nutrition assistance, formerly known as, um, as food stamps. Tempe schools were instrumental in helping get helping Mountain Park spread the word, and roughly half of those came said they heard about it through uh, their schools. Uh, next slide, please. Um, as I mentioned, we do provide um, assistance with um, eligibility for uh, the programs I mentioned. The uh, orange line there is Mountain Park, and the blue line is statewide, the number of new access applications. You would think that we would be seeing a lot of people coming in and applying for access, and we have not um, statewide. Uh, the people who have to renew every year who are already enrolled, those uh, numbers are down because those folks are not having to come in right now and complete their uh, renewal every year. But they will start having to do that again this fall. Um, we've been trying to aggressively market to people that we can help them get enrolled in access. We can get them enrolled in uh, other programs uh, as well, including the health insurance marketplace. And uh, with that, I uh, believe that I am turning it over to Ted Gutierrez from our staff to talk a little bit more about homelessness. Hi, thank you, Matt. My name is Ted Gutierrez. I am a referral coordinator and the community ambassador for the Tempe Clinic. Uh, I'm just gonna go ahead and highlight just a couple of things that the Tempe Clinic specifically does. One would, uh, as Deborah mentioned earlier, we do have a partnership with TCAA, where we actually have been able to help doing the medical screening uh, for eye health clients. So they wouldn't, uh, when the pandemic hit, we're able to medically screen them before they actually sort of entered the eye health program. Uh, we also continue to do referrals to the uh, Meals on Wheels program for our Tempe, uh, um, our Tempe residents. Uh, and we also refer out to uh, the, uh, area agency on aging for other uh, um, in-home meal delivery programs as well. We also have a partnership with Women for Women, and when that partnership does include everything from the donation drives to uh, bag assemblies, but we also, more importantly, as a distribution point for the bags for feminine hygiene for any women who are in need of those products. We also have been uh, actively doing uh, outreach with the Aries Foundation uh, in the past, and we hope to restart that up again. Uh, one of the things that the Tempe Clinic does do very well is we do uh, screening and identifying the needs of the patients we have. Uh, so we do ask stuff about food insecurity, uh, homelessness, uh, um, and uh, other needs. And when you come to the Tempe Clinic, you know, we are a family practice. We have family practice physicians. We also provide pediatrics and women's health. Um, and one of the things that we have started in this past year is our dental program at the Tempe Clinic itself. It has limited services at this time, but with more patients coming in for dental, we hope to expand those services. Uh, and like what Janie was saying earlier, uh, every patient that does come into our Tempe Clinic it still has access to our behavioral health counselors and our registered dietitians. Um, these are just a couple of the uh, uh, partnerships 
and services that we've been providing at the Sempe Clinic. Uh, and we're still continuing to look at for better ways to actually serve the community, especially in the time of the pandemic. And we're continuing to see uh, the patients that did come in for the screening for eye health to see if they do have primary care to actually still help them with their medical needs. Um, and we are continuing to uh, expand our partnerships with people we have and looking for new partners. Um, just because the pandemic hit didn't mean that we have to stop taking care of ourselves. And we're continuing to um, provide a safe environment uh, for our patients that come in. We operate a sick clinic and a well clinic so that patients don't have to uh, worry about coming in and being exposed to um, any unnecessary viruses. And um, I think that takes up about our time and Matt will take us yeah. out of Yes, I would like to introduce Selena Imam of ICNA Relief in Tempe. ICNA Relief strives to lift up underserved populations through a nationwide network of shelters, food pantries, health clinics, refugee services, and more. The organization works to build healthy communities, strengthen families, and create opportunities for those in need. Selena. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Selena Imam. I'm the director for ICNA Relief uh, Regional Chapter. So ICNA Relief is a nationwide organization, and we have 56 chapters in 27 states. So our chapter in Arizona is fairly new. We started in 2016. And I've been with the organization for the last four years. Um, so pretty much I have to start from the scratch. And um, uh, we've done so much in the last four years. So let me show you the intro video first, and then we'll talk about it more. Can you share the video for me? Alex? programs span across 25 states and feature 14 women's shelters, 27 food pantries, seven free health clinics, free counseling, refugee services, back to school giveaways, and a disaster relief program with a visible Muslim identity. You might think that once a refugee lands on US soil, their worries are over. Not quite. Did you know that refugees are required to pay back their airfare to the U.S. government within a year of their arrival? Imagine moving to a different country, trying to overcome a language barrier while dealing with issues such as unemployment, hunger, access to transportation, and bullying in school. What aspects does ICNA Relief help with? All of them. ICNA Relief has refugee services in 12 states across the country, and our staff helped close to 10,000 refugees originating from countries such as Syria, Burma, Iraq, and others in the past year alone. We provide monthly food baskets, car donations, case management, translation services, in-kind donations, and more. Since its inception in 2005, ICNA Relief has not only sheltered homeless women, it has helped them get back on their feet. Our transitional homes are more than just places where homeless women can sleep safely at night. They are centers of empowerment where women are encouraged to become self-sufficient individuals. Many of our women that come to our facilities have faced abuse, neglect, um, and really their lives have become unmanageable. So through ICNA Relief's transitional housing facilities, we help these women learn the skills that they need to gain self-sufficiency. Nearly 30 million Americans still do not have health insurance, and this number may increase. ICNA Relief is doing its part to combat this problem by offering basic medical services through our free medical clinics, mobile clinics, and health fairs. According to the National Retail Federation, parents spend over $600 on average every year on school supplies and apparel for their children. ICNA Relief's back-to-school giveaways hopes to ease this burden and give low-income children the tools they need for their education. In the past 11 years, ICNA Relief has responded to 47 natural and man-made disasters in the U.S., including major ones like Hurricanes Katrina and Sandy. Over 42 million Americans live in food-insecure households, about a third of whom are young children. 
To alleviate this national hunger crisis hitting families across America, ICNA Relief has established its hunger prevention program, which consists of food pantries, feed the hungry campaigns, and Ramadan food baskets. ICNA Relief literally is a grassroots organization that really is trying to, their best to provide a way to feed empower and elevate the community that we're involved in. With over 27 food pantries across 13 states, ICNA Relief is striving to make sure no American goes to sleep hungry. We're here today for parents to reach those. We have many food items. Uh, we're here uh, delivering food to a elderly um, lady that could not come out to our food pantry or to the local stores. Thank you, Igna Relief. Yeah, they filled up our chunk. They were really grateful. So all the stores are empty and everything out here. So for them to be out here, giving their time and service is awesome. They help us in the time of need, things that we can't supply of our own. They're good. God bless them. And I love them for helping me and my family. The food delivery that came in today, it should be supplying about 100 people. It just lets me believe that there's still so much hope out there. Our programs help over 222,000 people annually. You, the donors, helped us do that. In these difficult times, when Muslims aren't portrayed in a positive light, your support is even more crucial. ICNA Relief serves as a tool of dawah that shows that upholding true Islamic values means being a good neighbor to everyone. Hello. So my video is actually speak for us. Um, uh, we have exact same program here in Arizona also, and our main office in Tempe, our food pantry and the free health clinic. Um, during the pandemic, uh, we were open every single day, um, make sure people get their food when they need it. And we have a lot of mobile location. We actually try to reach out the neighbors. They don't have to drive to us like 30 miles, 40 miles away. We try to go every corner in the Arizona, make sure they got the food they need. And uh, also we try to give as much as possible with the hygiene and the cleaning product during this uh, hard time. And um, in Tempe, we, uh, if, as you can see, we serve nationally 731,473 people. Just in Tempe, we serve over 6,846 6, families and 13,600 children. So our footprint included in Yuma, Tucson, Phoenix, Mesa, Chandler, every city, you name it. And like I said, we just fairly new, it's been only four years old. And we have, um, it's a donor-based organization. Uh, we have a great uh, Muslim community here in Arizona who individually help us uh, for the fundraising. And um, this is the first time in last four years uh, we got some grants. So we did not have to worry as much as I was worried last three years. And um, we like to continue our service as long as we got the don donations and uh, grants. And we are so glad to be in Tempe and glad to serve Tempe City as well. Thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you very much, Selena. Um, and now we're gonna take a, a quick break to answer some questions. So um, once again, if you have a question, please write it in the, in the chat area of uh, WebEx. And if for some reason you're not able to access that or you are uh, just on the phone, um, then you can email me directly at Kristen underscore Gwen at Tempe.gov, K-R-I-S-T-I-N underscore G-W-I-N-N -N at Tempe.gov. Um, it looks like we've had a, a few questions as some of our speakers were talking. I don't know if everybody can see the answers that were written in the chat, so I'll go through those very quickly. Uh, one 
said when you say 779 walk-in visitors to the Oasis Center, I assume some of these are the same people, but on different days, or are they all unrepeated visitors? Um, and the answer from Deb, do you want to talk about that, Deb, or do you want me to just read it? Sure. Uh, what I said there is that uh, certainly some of those are repeat customers, and for us, this continued high volume confirms the ongoing need for a daytime relief site. Uh, and I made a note there, especially because shelter beds are nearly always occupied. Thank you. Um, Karen Lathan had a question about being able to get a copy of all of the presentations given today, and we are um, going to be posting this full presentation on the City of Tempe's website at www.tempe.gov slash human services. Um, so you'll be able to access all of this content there. Um, Marnie was asking who is behind the $2 million grant? Naomi, would you like to address that? Sure, the $2 million in funds coming in is coming from our community development block grant COVID care funds. Um, so that's $2 million for rental and mortgage assistance for any um, person or family that is um, experiencing economic hardship due to COVID-19. Great, um, and the money that is coming in for rental assistance, is that for section eight or for any renter who can access those funds? That'll be for any renter that are experiencing that economic hardship um, due to COVID. So job loss, um, possibly um, have gotten ill and not unable to work. So um, those would be the guide, some of the guidelines that we're learning right now as we speak um, so that we can um, develop a program to get those funds out. Um, question from David, um, are homeless people in Tempe becoming more aware of these various services? What if they don't live near the IHELP Emergency Center or the OASIS Drop-In Center? And what? Yes, yeah, so I mentioned there that word on the street is always the most effective way for promoting our services for homeless individuals and also through referrals that we receive from partners, uh, city emergency responders, uh, homeless outreach teams. That's the way that many become aware of these services uh, with OASIS, we started with um, um, making I help shelter clients aware of this and passing the word along the street. And then we started marketing the availability of it. And we, we have to be careful about that because we have limited capacity to serve the folks lining up for that uh, OASIS center. Thank you. Um, question from Nolan. What are some of the things that community members can do to support people experiencing homelessness? Naomi, would you like me to start with that? Sure. So I, I would say that in the I Help Shelter model utilizes partnerships and community resources like volunteers to provide overnight sleeping space, um, meals, um, employment opportunities from the business community. So there are a number of ways to support that program, not just financially, but through volunteer involvement, um, helping to serve meals. Um, helping to provide donated items that are needed for emergency food bags that are given away every day, water that we give out every day, um, things like that. Our website, tempeaction.org, lists a lot of those opportunities. Anybody else want to add anything to that? This Naomi. I think it's just really important. Um, everything Deborah said is is definitely um, right on. Um, it's also the community members really understanding what resources are out there um, so that maybe um, they can reach out to our HOPE team, our crisis response team, and other, non and other providers um, as a referral or just let us know um, what they're seeing out in the community because that's very helpful to us so that we can respond and engage. Yeah, and then also it will help us um, figure out like what are those gaps that we're seeing um, so that we can definitely work on, on um, resourcing those. Awesome, thank you everybody. There's a few other questions here, but I'm gonna save them for the second round of questions because I wanna make sure we have time for uh, the second session of presentations. Um, so with that, uh, I'm going to turn it back over, I think, to Naomi. 
Yes, you are. So we'd like to start off this session with a short video about the role human services plays in Tempe. Um, the video focuses on our work at, at the city level, but again, we do not do this work alone. And as you've heard today, we truly rely on our community partnerships to help meet the many needs in Tempe. So with that, we'll start the video. When you hear the words Tempe Human Services, you may not know what that means. You're not alone. But you see our work in the community every day. It's affordable housing for veterans. It's crisis services for victims of crime. It's preschool for our young learners. And the list can go on and on. You can look at the infrastructure of the city where you have um, roads and buildings and development, but human services is all about the heart. What are we here for? We're here to serve individuals, our families, our youth. It's really important that they have the resources that they need to really improve their quality of life. We don't do this work alone. We have multiple community partners, nonprofits, and interdepartmental collaborations that occur to make this work. Tempe Works is a perfect example of that. We connect people who are experiencing homelessness to the supportive services they need, and then we're able to connect them into housing. With this program, we're able to connect people with those jobs that they need through the city of Tempe. We have great examples of people moving from homelessness and changing their lives in a positive way. The city of Tempe has significantly invested in human services and has made it a top priority. It's important to note that for every dollar that the city spends on human services, the city receives approximately a little over two dollars from other governmental sources or nonprofit or other entities to enhance those dollars. Each and every day, human services is making a great impact in the community. When people need to be connected to housing, they need educational opportunities and access. If they just need basic things like food or clothing, then we're there for them. And together, our community is much stronger for that. Thank you. Um, next, I'd like to introduce Chris Charlo of the city's CARE 7 Crisis Response Program. CARE 7 has been in existence for more than 20 years and has evolved so much from providing on-site assistance during a police or fire call to a full slate of programs that help victims of crime, youth, veterans, and more. Chris? Hello, thank you, Naomi. Appreciate the introduction. Uh, my name is Kristen Charlo, and as Naomi said, I oversee the Care 7 team, which is uh, a lot of different uh, program areas under one roof. Uh, mostly, what we're trying to do is connect with people who have a need, don't know how to uh, fix their their problem, and so we help them to find a solution. So I think if we can go to the next slide, I can give an overview of, of the program areas in CARE 7. So as Naomi has alluded to, we have 24-hour-a-day, uh, seven-day-a-week crisis response unit that is typically dispatched with uh, Tempe Fire and or Tempe Police, but we don't always have to uh, respond with police and fire. We additionally have a second van for victim services that uh, responds with Tempe Police Officers and provides crisis response to victims of crime. We have an entire victim services team, which is uh, advocates, four advocates, two crisis responders, a counselor, a clinical counselor for victims, and our canine comfort dog, Sully, uh, who is literally everybody's favorite. Uh, we have veteran services. We have two social workers that work for CARE 7, providing case management services, and they are veterans themselves, and they provide services in Tempe's uh, Regional Veterans Court and really connect with the veterans in our community who are struggling and can really relate to them. We have a clinical counseling program that provides uh, sliding scale 
uh, counseling sessions for residents in our community and for victims of crime, those counseling sessions would be free. Uh, so they get referrals from the community, but referrals from our programs at CARE 7 and in human services as well. We have high school youth specialists. We have one in each of the seven high schools in the Tempe Union High School District. And they are there to engage with students who are struggling, who are at risk, who are having problems with their academic success because of things that are going on with them or in their home. And so the idea is to engage with those students during the school day, to listen, to validate, to involve them in activities and support groups and to help them develop some uh, coping skills so that they can learn when obstacles are put in their path, how to over overcome them on their own. Um, we have trauma awareness education and training through a grant where we provide education to the community uh, and to city our city partners to, about what the effects of trauma are on individuals, how it impacts their abil ability to live their best life, and how in children, when children live in uh, stressful situations or have repeated trauma, how it actually affects the development of their brain and can lead to lifelong problems. Uh, we have, as I said, case management, which is high intensity client services. So these are services through our social workers that help people really engage in complex systems and overcome uh, problems that are really complicated and chronic. And then our newest program through the Cities for Financial Empowerment, which is the financial navigation program Naomi was alluding to earlier, uh, which helps connect people with a variety of resources for financial empowerment. So uh, not only how they can get rental assistance or utility assistance through TCAA, but how they can get help consolidating credit cards or how they can get help with their student loans or things like that that can have um, long lasting effects on their financial um, issues. Next slide, please. So how has CARE 7 adapted during COVID to, for the needs of our program participants? I want to start off by saying that, um, you know, a lot of CARE 7 services didn't really make too many uh, changes to their delivery of their services. So the crisis response van, they're considered essential, essential personnel and first responders, and so they continued. And you know, it's been a scary time, I think, for all of us. And, and even during the initial stage of COVID, we're like, well, how are we gonna make sure that everybody's safe? But everybody's really worked hard and adapted very well. They um, continue to respond to people who are in crisis, uh, provide them services, transportation when necessary, connect them with long-term resources. And we just, clean a lot and use a lot of PPE. So we've had really virtually no problems with that. So I'm proud to say that they have continued just like our public safety uh, colleagues in the city of Tempe. Um, I think that the veteran services program and the victims of crime program, victim assistance program, also continue to do a lot of in-person service delivery because that's what the people need. When you've been a victim of a crime, especially if there's some, you know, significant domestic violence in your home and you've you've left with your children, you need to see somebody in person who can calm you and comfort you and help you know what all of your options are. So while taking the necessary safety precautions, we have continued to come to work every day and provide in-person services when they're needed. Of course, if we can do that virtually or over the phone, we will, but if somebody needs us in person, we're, we're gonna respond to that. Our licensed counseling program, uh, they immediately transitioned to telehealth, which was something that, um, I must say we weren't prepared for. Um, I think speaking earlier when Mountain Park was talking earlier, it was really a kind of a shock to our system and uh, required a lot of training. We had to get some, some uh, licenses through the Arizona Department of Health Services, but they did it. They did it uh, 
quickly. They did it with um, integrity. We got all of the things that we needed in place, including technology. Um, I think that it was probably harder for the people who had become used to coming in for counseling sessions. I think that was a difficult transition for them to make. They were used to being getting that comfort of a, their counselor sitting across from them, but everybody's done really well. And I think what we've learned is that a lot of people prefer this, this method. Telehealth really works for them. Think of people who have children or mobility issues or transportation issues. Telehealth really is working well for them. And so we um, know that that is a service that we will continue even after the pandemic ends, if it's ever really going to end. Um, once we come back to providing uh, services in person, we will continue the telehealth program. Uh, we also uh, uh, developed a COVID care program, which is uh, three free sessions for people who are really struggling with all of the things that COVID has, has brought with it, the isolation and the anxiety and the, you know, uh, 195 days at home with their children in a row that they were absolutely not prepared for. Um, and just not having all the supports in place like they have had in the past. So through those three free sessions, we just get people some some validation for what they're feeling and give them some skills so that they can cope with what's going on and some hope for for the future. So uh, if people still need to stay with us, then they can, but they can at least have those three free sessions. And those are those are available to anybody in this community, uh, even city employees. Next slide, please. The youth specialist program, you know, it was really interesting when all the students uh, went home, whenever that was, in March, a million years ago, all the students started um, attending school from home, and then it was summertime. And already by the end of school, we saw that a lot of kids were really anxious about, especially the kids that were going to be seniors for the next year, and they were really anxious about, you know, what's going to happen to them, and are they going to see their friends anymore, and all kinds of things. So. Uh, we actually, through a partnership with the school district, pro provided youth specialist services through the summer, throughout the summer, which I just thought was a really great way to address students and let them know we actually really do care about what happens to you even when school's out of session. Um, so they continued virtual support groups and uh, would do home visits or meet the students in community if they needed something. And we also developed a program where we delivered and dropped off outside food boxes from our friends at DCAA and hygiene kits uh, that we partnered with Threads through TCC. So we made sure that that our students, if they expressed uh, a, a, in conversation with their youth specialist that their family was struggling with food or didn't have toilet paper or didn't have cleaning supplies, we dropped that off to the youth specialists would rally, load the cars and drop off those supplies to the home. So that was really nice. Um, and I think that that really made a big difference. I think that that families felt really supported as much as they could during the summer. Um, so again, the financial navigator position that will be we're, we're launching that program to the public on October 5th. So look for more uh, to come from that. But that will be a queue. It will be an online system or text where people um, say I need help with my credit cards or fill in the blank and then our financial navigator will call that person back with resources and connections and help them navigate those systems so we're really excited about that that will be a year-long program um, continued uh, community resource connection for people that are still struggling with COVID. I think that you know we all think that COVID is going to end and everything's going to go back to normal and I think that what we're seeing at CARE 7 is that things are not going to be back to normal, that there are going to be some long lasting impacts from some of the things that people have experienced. And when you're already living on the edge and this set you back, it's going to take quite a while for people to recover. And I think the emotional toll that it has taken, we'll, we will be seeing for years to come. Um, CARE 7 also, uh, helped out at the cooling center. Uh, we stood up a cooling center. I'll let Nikki Stevens with the Hope team talk a little bit more about that. But uh, we're there 
uh, with the HOPE team daily. We're there twice a week. They're there three times a week to really connect with people and say, what brings you here? What can we help you with? Helping people get uh, hooked up with housing and documents and food and clothing, all the things that they need. So that's been um, for us at CARE 7, because we are a mental health organization and the mental health of the people that that we work with is paramount to us. Um, we really can help people with some general mental health issues to stabilize, to work with them, to let them know that these are difficult times, but we're here for you. Let us get you some support and let us help, it, help you attend to some of your other basic needs to take the pressure off and maybe alleviate some of the stress that you're feeling during these difficult times. Next slide, please. So um, Naomi was speaking about the CARES Act um, funding. And so uh, we plan to get one year funding for another licensed counselor, which I, I, I don't want to belabor the point, but the mental health of our community was um, precarious <laughs> prior to the pandemic. It's even more so now. So we have uh, uh, another counselor that will come on board and, and help people navigate these times. We will also be getting six more youth specialist positions for Tempe Elementary School District. So the seven that we have in the high schools will be joined by six. Uh, we will have four in middle school and two in K through eight schools. And we are very excited. That program is um, very successful and we're hoping that the younger we can intervene with some of these students, the more likely that we can help them develop skills so that they won't um, have so many problems when they get to high school. So we're very excited about that. And then the new grant award, which is not CARES Act funding for the financial navigator position. Um, next slide, I think that might be it. Um, I really want to say that one of the best successes that we've, we've experienced is having the emergency units that um, Naomi alluded to earlier, being able to take people who are in a crisis and put them in a safe place where they can sit and relax for a minute and get clinical case management from our case managers and our social workers has just been incredibly successful, helping lead them down the path to self-sufficiency and connect with, with um, job bank and the work programs and develop their resumes and help them get their kids situated in school and address their transportation problems, but mostly address the issues that got them to where they were in a crisis to begin with. And so, that program has brought us really at CARE 7, the ability to help people from the point of their crisis all the way through the continuum to and up to and including their healing journey. So we're very grateful to have the ability to do that. Thank you. I think I'm supposed to, who am I supposed to introduce next? I am so sorry. I think that Nikki Stevens is up next talking about the HOPE team. I, I'm sorry if I was supposed to do that. I apologize. It's okay, Chris. Do you want to? Okay, Naomi and I are in the same room, so we did not want to have some feedback, so we had her mute her, her computer. Okay, so I'm excited to always speak about the HOPE Outreach Team. They do amazing work for our most vulnerable citizens who unfortunately call the streets of Tempe their home. So one of the things that our team does is basically take people from the streets to housing. They actually walk them through that journey of becoming self-sufficient again. So identifying what the gaps are, what their needs are, if they need ID, they need social security card, if they need um, their birth certificate, being able to assist them in getting those items and um, being able to access housing at some point. 
one of the best ways that you as a community can support some of the people that we serve is through is through advocate, advocating that's at your local level that's at your legislative level that um, that ensures the people that we serve get the money that they need in order to, for us to get the money we need out to all the nonprofits and ensuring the people that we serve get the uh, things they need to be successful. Next slide, please. So one of the things I want to start with is the state of homelessness in the East Valley cities. So homelessness is on the rise regionally. Maricopa County's unsheltered population is to, at the last point in time count was 3,776. And Maricopa County's unpop, I'm sorry, unsheltered population increased 18% from 2019 to 2020. So if you look at the surrounding cities and from 2019 to 2020, I feel that Tempe has done a really great job of getting a handle on some of the resources that are needed to assist the people that we serve. So if you look at the change, we've had a 6% increase compared to a lot of the other East Valley cities in our in our surrounding communities. I did put Phoenix in there as well, just to kind of give a, a demonstration of how large that population is in comparison to uh, the East Valley cities. Next slide, please. So the services that are provided by the HOPE outreach team include daily street outreach. So they are going out into the parks, uh, on the streets, abandoned buildings, the river bottoms, to cars. We frequently get calls from uh, the Tempe Police Department, from council communicators, from 311, and our team is extremely responsive and they have a whatever it takes attitude. They really, they really do. They, they, they amaze me because they get things done and connect people to services that you would never think possible. One of the other things is the photo IDs. Uh, getting somebody an identification is extremely important. If you don't have an ID, if you don't have an address, you don't really exist in our community. So that's so important. And you know, our human services, uh, I'm sorry, the human services campus downtown, Phoenix, is one of the only homeless post office created in the community. We also have a PO box address that we use so people can send their items in. Um, we partner with TCAA to, ensure people are getting connected to shelter as well as being able to have a place where they can have the PO box to send their uh, documents to. Housing assessments are extremely important as well. So the housing assessments that are provided through our HOPE outreach team are called VI SPDATs. They're vulnerability um, SPDATs where it assesses their vulnerability and also what housing needs they need. And that's extremely important in our community through a coordinated uh, assessment process. We also have connections to the behavioral health providers in our community, um, including, you know, Mountain Park and Health. Mountain Park and Health has been a great partner of ours as well as through donations and other avenues as well. Um, their connection to substance use providers is extremely um, well managed. They're able to connect people and get them into detox, get them connected to substance use services. They have a lot of uh, connections that um, beyond just the city of Tempe that they can get people in. We also have a Tempe mental health court, and that is extremely important as well. Our staff attends those every Tuesday, and they sit in court. So there's, if there's individuals who are diagnosed with a serious mental illness and um, also are experiencing homelessness, our team does a housing assessment on them and get them document ready and connect them into housing resources. One of the unique things about our team, too, is it's the only one of the only mobile coordinated entry access points for both singles and families. So they're able to do housing assessments on uh, singles and families. So it's instead of them, instead of families or, or people having to go to one center, we can do those assessments anywhere in the city. So that's a unique aspect of the work that we do as well. One of the other things we have funding for is through diversion. So that's connecting people back to their families. So they may be in another city, another state, and we uh, check to make sure they have a safe place to go. And then we're able to get them bus tickets and uh, send them back to their family to end their homelessness. The other thing that HOPE does is we are a partner with the Homeless Management Information System. So all the team um, are certified HMIS 
data entry specialists and they're able to get information in and share the information throughout the community. Next slide, please. So one of the things I'm very proud of uh, during the COVID-19 response was that our team never, as you know, CARE 7 has pointed out and a lot of these other nonprofits have pointed out is that our services never stopped during this pandemic. We have continued to still be out there, uh, of course, using PPE and other protections, but getting masks uh, distributed to individuals experiencing homelessness, getting information out to them about COVID-19, we did a great program with Susie, our PIO, and we're able to get signage placed throughout the community to let people know um, how to, um, you know, keep safe, ensure that they were keeping sanitary, getting uh, masks out to them, getting water, food. So that's been extremely important that we continued to be responsive to their needs, even during the pandemic, as, um, as you guys know, everything shut down. So during the pandemic, Homeless Solutions partnered with Maricopa County, nonprofits, and faith-based or faith-based organizations to ensure we met the needs of our most vulnerable experiencing homelessness in the city of Tempe during the pandemic. Due to many businesses and nonprofits and government buildings being shut down, Homeless Solutions looked for innovative ways to continue to serve individuals who are at risk and still needed their basic needs met. This meant that people we served did not have access to food resources, clean water, emergency shelter, or showers. So one of the ways that we responded during the pandemic was that we continued to provide our outreach services. And the uh, response we got from people experiencing homelessness was very heartfelt. They knew that we were out there supporting them. They knew that we would be there every day for them. Uh, we continued to provide the housing assessments, the applications for housing. We made appointments for them through the motor vehicle division to get their IDs. We continued to order birth certificates, social security cards, and anything they needed to continue their housing journey. Homeless Solutions also partnered with our PIO and the entire uh, Tempe community to get donations during the pandemic. So community partnership was extremely important during this time where we were able to uh, get food, water bottles, masks, hand sanitizer. Uh, this was uh, distributed during our outreach. Uh, I would get a shout out to the Ayers Foundation as well. They were extremely supportive to us during this time and provided prepackaged meals and um, have been a great partner for us. In response to the abrupt end to shelter intakes, uh, the Maricopa County Human Services Department worked with East Valley cities such as Tempe to secure 25 hotel rooms for our most vulnerable, identified by our outreach teams. Hope outreach teams would do daily check-ins with the people in the hotel and would work on permanent housing solutions for each of them. One of the other partnerships that we were proud of that we created was a non-congregate non shelter that was temporary through our Tempe Salvation Army. This was also for vulnerable populations, which had, we had 10 beds there and it was for about 45 days and we were able to transition those people into either into housing or into another safe environment to ensure that their um, medical needs and other needs were being met. The interdepartmental collaborations within the city of Tempe were extremely valuable during the pandemic. Um, Homeless Solutions, Community Services, that's our Parks Department, and the Tempe Police Department partnered to create shower program for individuals experiencing homelessness in the city of Tempe during this time. This was extremely successful and allowed the outreach team to connect and provide services to individuals while they were at the shower program. Homeless Solutions um, also responded to the Center for Disease Control Guidelines on unsheltered populations by providing a total of seven hand washing stations located throughout the city of Tempe. This was to ensure people experiencing homelessness had access to soap and water to mitigate the spread of COVID-19. Due, due to the pandemic, many places that people experiencing homelessness could take refuge to escape the heat had closed. Homeless Solutions, Community Services, Care Seven all partnered to create the cooling station locate the cooling stations that were located throughout the city of Tempe. This allowed people a place to have refuge and escape the heat, and were provided water and services. So we had, as, as uh, Chris from Care Seven alluded to, they're there twice a week, and Hope was there three times a week, and still continues that partnership right now. 
Um, Homeless Solutions is currently a part of the Maricopa County Heat Relief Network. Um, we began water collection and we've received such an abundance of generous donations of water. We still are in need of water, but during that time it was so uh, welcoming and we were able to distribute cases of water to people at the river bottoms that didn't have access to a lot of the, uh, um, you know, the resources in the community. These are some of our most uh, mentally ill and some of our most vulnerable citizens as well. Um, one of the other cool things we did during the COVID-19 was we distributed cell phones to those individuals. So we were able to get cell phones down to the river bottom um, for those individuals. So they were able to contact us or they were able to contact crisis services if they needed. They were able to tell us when they needed food. It was a great connection back to the services being provided through the human services department and the nonprofits in our community. Next slide, please. One of the things I always get asked about is how people can volunteer in our community. Um, one of the ways that you can volunteer is through our annual uh, point in time count. We don't know if HUD is going to have one this year, but Naomi has been, been very adamant that it's important that we do do this, especially after the um, eviction moratoriums is lifted in December. So in January 2021, the last week of January, we will have our annual point in time count. Um, as you can see from last year's 2020 point in time count, as I alluded to earlier, there was an 18% increase of unsheltered populations. We also had a 7% increase of sheltered populations as well, with a total of a 12% increase overall. Um, on any uh, last January 27, 2020, we had 7,419 people experiencing homelessness in both sheltered and unsheltered throughout our um, entire Maricopa County and in our community. Um, that is something we should all be concerned about. Um, these, these are our most vulnerable citizens. They are Tempeans, just like you and I. I think it's extremely important that we support them and we work with them and, and get them from homeless to house. So I appreciate everybody's time and thank you. Thank you, Nikki. Um, this is Kristen again. We're going to take another uh, break to answer some questions. Um, and I know that there were uh, there were some questions in the Q&A um, about uh, what TCAA is going forward. Deb, do you want to talk about that briefly? Certainly. So what I've responded there is it's it's critically important that we stay the course. We continue to prioritize services for folks that have been affected by the pandemic. And, um, you know, it's it's a matter of keeping the lights on, but also I think uh, Kristen was supposed to take over this part of the presentation. If there's any um, qu there's a Q and a and. At this point. Did we lose her? We have um, we have uh, additional questions that are sort of logistical about where the cooling center is located and um, I guess where people might be able to go if they're in need of a shower. Hi, this is Naomi. Sorry, I can um, definitely answer the question as far as the cooling center. The cooling center is located at our Pyle Adult Recreation Center on Southern and Roll in the by the library. Um, I'll let Nikki answer as far as other resources for showers. So when our shower program um, ended, when we created it during the pandemic, we had we were able to provide people's bus passes to get to St. Vincent de Paul's. But one of the cool things we did as well was we did purchase our own mobile showers during that time. So, uh, you know, if, if there's a need that persists, we definitely can look at opening showers in the city to ensure everybody is decent, safe and sanitary. Thank you. Um, there's a question here asking um, on behalf of all the children who lost free lunch in Tempe schools since March. What's what's been happening for those families? Um, there are there are schools uh, within Tempe where 100 percent of students are eligible for the free lunch program. So what has happened during school closures as far as those those meals? Uh, 
Um, I was going to see if Naomi wanted to address that. If not, I can certainly. The schools, all the districts had plans to make sure that they had uh, food for the students. And so they had that set up at the schools for, for quite a while. Um, additionally, where we had staff, if we if if we learned from uh, other staff at the schools or from the students themselves that that there were families with food insecurity, then we um, delivered food boxes to them. And now that the schools have started up again, even though many of the students are still uh, learning remotely, our youth specialists are actually on the campus. And so they're working with the faculty and staff to make sure that all the students are being taken care of. So we've already worked with um, TCAA to get many, many, many food boxes and we've delivered those to each of the schools so that the students can have access to those. Thanks, Chris. Um, we have a question here about the accessibility of um, general health and mental health services, particularly for people without health insurance. And I would add an additional question that I got um, wondering if, uh, if there are places our panelists could point to where folks without health insurance could get a flu shot for free this year. So I'll, I'll address the mental health question. Um, I think that the, the, the sad truth is that um, a lot of our community mental health agencies are really uh, overwhelmed right now. Uh, our services here at CARE 7 in our counseling program are specifically for uh, either our referrals or people who are uninsured or underinsured or who simply can't afford to pay their copay. We try to get people to where they need to be. If we know somebody um, has insurance, we try to get them to a provider on their insurance. If they are seriously mentally ill, we get them hooked up back up with our clinic. So we're, so we're always trying to get people to the right Place with the shortest weight so that um, they're, they're feeling supported. And, you know, we're having to get pretty creative about a lot of our program delivery because we're. Um, support groups for parents and all kinds of different methodologies, including videos that we'll be posting that'll help people to understand where they are and what they can access. We think that video delivery is becoming a really preferred uh, way for people to get their information. So look for those very soon on the CARE7 website. Um, and I do believe that, Nikki, do you have information about flu shots for folks i know we yes, just had do a thank you so one of the things that we are working on in conjunction with the arizona department of health services and the tempe fire medical rescue is to provide flu shot free for the entire community this will get us prepared when hopefully there's a covid 19 vaccination so we're excited about partnering with them and hopefully within the next couple weeks or within the month, we'll have some information that we'll distribute out to the community to let them know where and when they can get their flu shot. If I could also jump in real quick on the general health care. Uh, one of the things that Mountain Park does provide is an eligibility department, which you can actually call our main number, schedule appointments to actually come into our office and actually meet with our eligibility uh, uh, counselors who will review uh, um, you're, if you're eligible for access, put the application in for access and uh, start your health care from that point. If you don't qualify for health for access, uh, we do have our slider program that actually works with uh, the patients uh, on a cash pace basis that would include services that uh, prices range from anywhere from $25 to $100 uh, per visit type of deal. So that's one of the things that we do to help address this uh, as well. Thank you all. Can I follow up with what Ted said? 
Um, we are already giving out flu shots, both children and adults. Um, and then for our mental health, we provide uh, mental health services to our established patients. And really what we look at this as is a very low um, barrier point of entry. So people who, who normally may have been told go see someone and they're not going to, instead we bring someone in directly to them and have that conversation with them. And before we wrap up, I just wanna share a lot of these issues, um, elections matter with the issues we're talking about today. And Mountain Park will be a polling place for the day before the election and on the election. So anyone who wants to vote in person or drop off their ballot, again, on the northeast corner of McClintock and Broadway. Thank you so much, everybody, for all of those questions. Um, and now I'm going to remember Lauren to wrap things up for us. Thank you, everybody. Thank you to all that participated today, Councilmember Adams, our city staff, and especially Naomi Farrell, who created this event, our council aides, Kristen Gwynn and Alex Chin, and community members who tuned in to learn more or do more, and our nonprofit partners, CARE 7, Mountain Park, where I get my health care, by the way, um, TCAA, ICNA Relief, and our own Human Services Department. You are all rising to the challenges of our time. You know, it's, it's really easy to get weighed down by all that's happening in our, in our country and in the world. And as we heard today, the needs are greater than they've ever been with a tsunami of needs expected in the winter. So we absolutely have our fair share of challenges in Tempe and exacerbated by the pandemic. And homelessness, as we've heard today, is one of our biggest challenges in Tempe. And after hearing from the presenters, I'm inspired. Um, we as a community have added new programs to help our houseless neighbors, we are helping to ensure that families and seniors have food on the table. We are caring about each other's mental health. We're helping people to stay housed with rent and utility assistance. And TCAA alone, they've served over 2,000 clients and ICNA Relief, 80 families a week in La Victoria neighborhood are, are receiving food baskets and substantial food baskets. The list of need and response goes on and on and on. But like everyone here, I'm really passionate about expanding our affordable housing options in Tempe. And as you heard today, we're gonna to be adding more housing with newly available federal funds. And that's a really great feature of our program. We also have plans to boost our emergency home repair, emergency home repair fund, which will help people stay housed. We have much work to do, but this gives me hope even knowing that there's a tsunami of need that we're expecting once um, all the evictions resume. In past years, GAIN has been a neighborhood citywide experience of, of bringing the community together on one day, one night, in celebration and social gatherings. This year's COVID-19 response um, presence has made it impossible to meet together, and I know we're all gonna miss that opportunity, but Tempe neighborhoods together, they've come forward with augment this year's event, and that's creating the program Tempe Gains by Giving. And so we're going to encourage our neighbors to donate locally to organizations who are on the ground in Tempe doing the work of human services in our community. So stay tuned for more information about that. And um, before we log off, there's just a few action steps that you can take that, to help shape the future of our community, human services or otherwise. And one is to call your senators, McSally, and cinema and urge them to pass the COVID relief bill that's been stalled in the Senate since May. This will help fund cities that are under 500,000 in population. You might not know that cities that are over 500,000 in population, notably Mesa and Tucson and Phoenix, got a lot more funding than poor little Tempe and, and other cities in, in Arizona. And um, we really need to fund cities to, to give more direct services to those in need. I also urge you to contact your governor, Governor Ducey, and ask him to release aid to cities. What he's done is, is held off on some funds, put it into the general fund. And in Tempe's case, we're lacking $12 million in funding that would really go to helping the houseless and helping housing insecure people in our community. Next, please go online and you see this little uh, link here above. It's um, our annual human services needs assessment. Tell us what's important to you and help guide our city tax dollars to improve housing or add services for seniors or help our veterans. Please, it's essential that we hear what you think we should be doing with our human services budget. 
Um, and you can also email council member Adams, Jennifer underscore Adams at Tempe.gov. I'm Lauren underscore QB at Tempe.gov. Let us know what we can do better because we are an open city that realizes we don't always have the best ways. And we need to hear from you, the community, about how we can improve our approach to human services in this time of great need. So I want to thank everyone again for participating and spending time with us today. And with that, we'll sign off. And thank you so much for being here and giving up an hour and a half or more of your day. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.